All right, guys. So this is going to be the breakout session for the thin control plane. Um, what we're trying to do is minimize the footprint that exists uh, out at the edge. So a little bit of background on myself. Um, I, 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 I work for Verizon 17 plus years. I've now moved over to Dell. Uh, one of the things that I worked on as part of Verizon was uh, the deployment of the white box and the utilization of OpenStack uh, at the edge uh, in a white box environment. So <clears throat> one thing that we had to sort of solve was how to fit the entire OpenStack um, suite of projects into um, a little bitty, sometimes four core machine, right? So that four core machine, you know, we need to leave a little bit of space for at least some VNF capability. So in doing that, it's sort of analogous to, you know, everybody's seen the Apollo 13 movie where you've got the toaster and you're trying to, you know, run everything without consuming more than one amp. So that's kind of the analogy that we were running into with OpenStack running on a, a white box out at the customer premise. So one of the things that, you know, we are trying to solve in terms of that challenge um, as a community is how do we optimize that space? How do we come up with um, use cases that um, you know, leave enough resources on the machine to provide the local edge compute that we need to run those specific scenarios while also allowing ourselves enough overhead to also manage those resources in, 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 uh, in, a, in an efficient manner? So what I'd like to concentrate on in, in terms of you know, at least this breakout session is identifying kind of the critical components, right? So what are absolutely necessary for running in the edge? And what are those components that we need uh, to fulfill the, the use cases that are going to be running at the edge? So I realize there's probably a lot of topics and things like that that exist uh, in this area. But I'm just trying to make sure that we don't sort of you know, go off on different tangents in terms of you know, kind of uh, identifying. So what I'd kind of quickly like to do is just identify what sort of solutions you guys are seeing out there. Um, can I, is anybody out here currently you know, involved in any sort of edge, compu edge compute project or anything like that in the show of hands? Anybody? There's a few. Oh, Beth. Yeah. Yeah, Beth. Er, Beth, you didn't have to raise your hand. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. So, what, what, I, what, just to kind of get things going, you know, what, what are some of the the ideas or some of the topics that uh, you know we're looking at in terms of what you guys think um, that we need to start covering? So, what we would like to do is start capturing some use cases and how we can apply this, and you know, maybe look at, you know, what those situations entail. Anybody? Oh. Do you want? I can kick it up. Go for it. Yeah. Sure. Why not? Uh, so, yeah, Glenn is, of course, very aware of, of uh, our project since I think you had a lot to do with it. Um, but I think the biggest thing was uh, minimizing the footprint. So we used um, containers. So I think containers is a really, really important component to getting everything down, minimize. Um, also, I know composable, compostable, um, OpenStack is a big topic, and that's you know separating out the components so they can stand, so you can sort of mix and match them and use what you need. Uh, so there's some key internal ones you need, but um, sometimes you don't need everything, uh, and why not just have a mix and match and use what you need? So there's some minimum components, right? We obviously may need Nova. We're going to need um, Neutron. You know, maybe glance for some local storage. Maybe there's some other alternatives right here, I think. Yeah. Sorry, this is a point of clarity. Is when you say what pieces are needed at the edge, you're talking about OpenStack components rather than components in general. I mean, it doesn't have to be OpenStack. Um, you know, we can, we can look at ways of leveraging you know, maybe Kubernetes or something like that. One of the things that I'm passionate about is if I look at the NFEs that we have today from a vendor standpoint, there's still very large monolithic applications when you break them down, and they're kind of still black box. All you've really done is move them from hardware into software. They're yep. still the black box. That's they're there. physical virtual appliances. Yeah, so yeah. it's, to me, NFV means that you, we're not really 
following the true meaning of what I would consider NFE, which is virtualizing the network function itself. So we should have you know, separate functions, you know, like layer three, layer two functions, and things like that, as opposed to a, a very large, fat sort of black box NFE, which is kind of where I think a lot of the bloat comes from. So when you look at NFE, you look at a lot of the NFE solutions that we have out there are, you know, you boot up that NFE, it's a routing function, for example, or it's a firewall. The basis of that is a, a VM. So it, they boot up their Linux OS, and then maybe they raise some containers within that OS, and then they run their custom code, and then that is your NFE. And I'm thinking, we could get away from that. And some of that, maybe, you know, we start at the most fundamental level and say, look, can we design some more function-based stuff as opposed to monolithic-based NFE? Uh, we, we have that uh, challenge as well, where we have these monolithic uh, giant uh, uh, virtual network functions, and they have a cluster of VMs. So for edge computing, as I said earlier, we need like certain critical VMs to run at the edge. Uh, that's part of the cluster, but remaining VMs are at running at a different centralized location. So two things that come into key part is orchestrating this, making sure that you know we have give right policy server groups so that we have these uh, VMs that has to work on the edge. It's orchestrated at the edge, and the uh, uh, remaining VMs uh, or the containers. Uh, are at the you know, central location, and also the networking part. How do we stitch the networks between the VMs that are at the edge uh, to the centralized VMs? Okay. Or you know, offloading also some uh, traffic uh, uh, locally at the edge. So those are the two uh, key things that come to my mind. OK. And just to kind of elaborate, I think of BGP. What if you have BGP as a service that's running as sort of an NFV uh, VNF running inside a container. You don't need an entire router. I just want BGP and maybe some functions to support BGP. That could be just its own separate containing or separate um, um, service that's running with it. We don't need the router. We don't need all the, the other components there, too. So that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Any other ideas? So I'm, I'm interested in management footprint. Um, as part, because the control plane implies the management of that control plane, and so minimizing it isn't just the, the mechanical footprint, but I think also the management footprint, the APIs, the number of control planes yeah. um, that you have to encounter, right? Verizon's example is really good. They, they put OpenStack on that box in order to reuse the APIs for OpenStack, but then when you look at what AT&T has, AT has done, they've added layers and layers of of infrastructure, for good reason, but to, to add a lot of management, it's not a thin management control plane at that point. I, I, you know, I think there's different ways to attack it. I think everybody has a similar problem, um, but I can speak for the way Verizon implemented it. I was there, um, and that was, you know, trying to stretch the back, uh, you know, the um, the the bus that exists within OpenStack. You know, across uh, you know, 30 or 40 mile access uh, link there is a little troublesome. So you know, that's where we arrived at. Okay, let's put control on the box, and then that exposes all of the OpenStack APIs. But there's a cost associated with that, right? There's the overhead that's generated. So in your point, you know, from a management standpoint, managing that component, you know, kind of becomes even simpler by kind of boiling away, you know, the the structure that's needed. So. You know, that's where things become really attractive uh, when you're discussing how do we avoid implementing an entire OpenStack um, or anything um, type of uh, environment there. Any other questions or ideas? So let's kind of jump into some of those uh, topics a little bit. Um, you know, one idea that was kind of talked about was, um, you know, do we actually want to run OpenStack that far out at the edge? Um, you know, wh what are some what are some alternative methods there for for that? I, 
think there's been a lot of talk about, um, you know, obviously uh, putting containers out there uh, on bare metal and then leveraging some sort of bare metal infrastructure management, um, like Ironic, or, you know, there are, there are other, there are, and Rob's smiling, I know he, he's, yeah. uh, he's not a fan of that. Rack, rack HD, things <laughs> like that, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, but there, there is that, you know, there is that option, and, and putting that out there um, then begs the question, how do you manage that infrastructure? And, you know, how is, how is it configured, and how, is, how does ops deal with that? And um, now you have bare metal out there with a management, uh, container management on top of that, uh, let's say Kubernetes. Um, so now you have, you know, two management planes, something managing your infrastructure and then managing your, your, your containers. Um, so, you know, you're going to have to do infrastructure management somewhere. Yeah. Um, do you just want to have one tool or do you want to have multiple tools? And when we're talking edge sites, as we, someone said here earlier, you know, and, and some of the people that are doing it, we could have hundreds of thousands of edge sites. Um, so these management tools that are not aggregated, they don't have a uh, infrastructure manager of infrastructure managers or uh, container manager of container managers. Uh, I like to think of it as kind of like what open daylight is to SDN. Um, now you become, you know, no one's even mentioned ops here. Uh, the poor, poor people in ops, um, you know, they're told, you know, edge site J64986 is having problems. <laughs> so do I, do I go into my horizon and I, you know, go down to that region if I have a control plane there and, you know, scroll down through 10,000 of them and say, oh, there's J936 and I yeah. go in there and I look. Um, you know, that's a lot of control planes. But on the other hand, if I don't do a control plane there and I try to do edge sites with single control planes, how big can I do it? And that goes back to the scaling issues that, or the scaling challenges of OpenStack of how do we do 10,000 regions and how do we federate and replicate glance, flavors, um, you know, all, all sorts of things. I mean, OpenStack was totally not designed for those use cases. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's taking a hammer to, you know, make everything looks like a nail um, from that perspective. It, you know, and I think it's, we're setting ourselves up for you know, disappointment if we're just going to try and slam, oh, you know, an op say this is an OpenStack problem all of a sudden, when the, the scope and nature of it's very different than when OpenStack was designed and what it was suited for. So we're, like when we tried to make OpenStack a container running engine, and that wasn't a good model you know, either. It wasn't, it's not architecturally the, the right solution. Right. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I think we look at reducing complexity, right? I think there's going to be certain things that we always have to maybe care for. You know, management's one aspect of it. How do we dice it up into the different layers? Who's going to re have the responsibility? Because we still, not just the compute, right? We also have the SDN layers. What if we want to couple something like that with, say, you know, like a big switch fabric or, or something like that? And, you know, then we have the SDN component in association with the compute components. You know, it becomes sort of this big monster, right? So, and there are, you know, I don't know if it's a solution, but there are, you know, projects where, you know, the, the, at least the community has come up with mechanisms for cascading OpenStack. Um, that's very fat, I think. Um, so how do we reduce that complexity? How do we how do we kind of minimize that footprint and you know come up with, with solutions to minimize that footprint? And, and you know I think there is a third option, and, and I think it feeds into what Rob was saying is, you know what we it wasn't designed for this, and I think that's why we're all here today, um, you know to figure out, you know if. If we are going to be a player, as far as OpenStack is going to be a player in this edge market, where are the challenges that we see? And um, you know, if it's a if it is a octagonal box that we're trying to put in a square hole, um, how do we how do we shave the edges off, or how do we change the hole to to you know or, or head towards that design? But I think there's a third option. I think Rob would even agree with me on this one: is that taking the services and disaggregating them forgetting about the way that we think about them and spreading them out um, and only aggregating the ones that need to be aggregated. I do strongly agree that um, 
we need the, I think the good discussion here is what parts of OpenStack are a good fit for the, the pains that we're dealing with, right? What, what things are we trying to solve that where, where we're playing to OpenStack strengths? Um, and then figure out, you know, where the weakness, I mean, that's what you're trying, this is exactly what we're trying to do with these yeah. sessions, right? Um, so let's, I guess let's come up with a, with, you know, maybe a use case or maybe, um, you know, what, what can we put together to, that would be something that you would consider lightweight and maybe define some parameters like, you know, it's a four core machine. Maybe it can hyper thread, maybe it can't. Um, you know, so what are our options there? What use cases can we come up with, say, with a four core machine? Anybody, right? Anybody can answer this or anybody, you're not going to be. No, it doesn't. No, let's let's open the, the gates, right? Okay. I'm, I mean, you can easily put a uh, CPE device on it, especially one of the smaller CPEs. You can easily put an IoT bridge on something like that, as long as you don't burden it with running 25 different OpenStack services. Um, you need a looser coupling model. Um, OpenStack is cu tightly coupled, um, centralized cloud. Like Rob said, it's not going to fit. You can hammer it into it, uh, or you can uh, use the AT&T model where they put an orchestrator, loosely coupled orchestrator, um, e-comp, right? And then put a bunch of infrastructure uh, glue code that says we can talk to this type of infrastructure provider, OpenStack. We can talk to another one. We can talk to SDNs, right? So all of this allows you to create, essentially, a glue of different regions of different capabilities, and then you can run your application on top of it. Yeah. So just one observation. If you're looking to build something for the edge, it's not going to have the same number of OpenStack operations per second as something which is running, say, in the core of your network. So if I'm running a cloud in a traditional area, my OpenStack might require very heavy infrastructure. Personally, I run OpenStack on two machines. One is a Raspberry Pi. It controls a machine with eight cores where I run Nova, and I have my storage. Okay. That is my development environment. That is perfectly reasonable if you want to use it in an edge, because OpenStack is not part of your application fast path. When you want to do some provisioning operation, talk to the little CPU on the Raspberry Pi. That's more than enough. OK, that's a good point. About disaggregating the services. I, I assume you mean getting away from having a one-to-one -one kind of, you have one Nova, you have one sender. Is that right? Yeah, this is the thing I was trying to get at before, which I, I was confused about why. Really? <laughs> um, this guy broke my concentration. Um, which is, yeah, um, which is the, the feeling that there's a need to have a one-to-one -one relationship. I, I feel like this comes from people using existing deployment tools that have a controller role, and that is the only thing that there is, right? And so they like, well, I need three controllers because I need my Nova to scale that big, and now I've got three glances that I don't really need, or, or vice versa, right? Well, give an example, you know, kind of just give an example so that we have an understanding of what you're trying to to summarize what you're what you're describing here this is a perfect situation from your perspective. Give an example. Uh, so you, you're commenting on on what his um, you know. Triple O, for example, for okay. a while had a controller role, and that was it. Yeah. Right. And you could you could spin up a controller, but you got another Ceph, another Glance, another Neutron, another. You just added another like, layer, basically. All, well, you just you you couldn't you couldn't scale Nova API when when you just needed to add more Nova APIs, and so. Uh, do you have specific things that um, 
that you have encountered that don't work well about like, because lots of people run multiple glances and distribute them around so that they're close to their computes instead of just the one glance that like people from the outside of the network hit when they need to upload an image. Like, I feel like there's patterns to follow there. Yeah, totally. Right. I, I think we're falling into some of the same pitfalls that we always fall into uh, in these discussions, which is, you know, how do we solve the current issues with the current tools or the current mentalities, right? So how can we come up with different mentalities of, you know, addressing these, these issues? I mean, so I think, I think we're kind of led to how can we do a full OpenStack environment, maybe, but it always ends up in these conversations about horizontal scale and how do we proxy certain services and things like that. So how do we, how do we kind of break that cycle and, and get out of that? When you're talking about uh, thin control planes, you're, you're talking, at least when, uh, I think the understanding from what I've heard from people is they're thinking about that, that linear architecture that monolithic linear architecture, and how do I trim that down? How do I make it skinnier? Even you said, what do I do with a, with a four core box? Yeah. Um, I'm thinking the, the next step, um, and, and you know, I've heard Rob even talk about this, is, is containerizing uh, the control plane services and placing them right alongside with the same management, uh, Kubernetes management, as your workloads. So they're no different. They're just another service that rides. But, but yeah, but in there. containerization is not necessarily, uh, you know, reducing complexity, right? You know, there could be a bad way for implementing containers where just containerizing something is in and of itself is not, you know, a reduction of complexity. It's. I'm not reducing complexity. I'm, I'm lightening the load. Okay. There you go, right Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the benefit of. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, the benefit of containers in a lot of these cases is that you have a distribution mechanism that's portable. So I can deliver code to a new location without having to you know, worry about a lot of configuration management. And then you have to deal with secrets injection and initializing it and, and making it part of the cluster. I, I keep going back to the, if, if I'm just, if I have a single system, and I, under, I know what Verizon was doing you know, with the OpenStack APIs, but if I have a single system, a lot of the node placement and image management and things like that that you get out of OpenStack don't apply. You don't need it, um, right? It's, it's designed for a multi-node system. If we were talking about a four-node system or a, something like that, I think that's actually a different class of problem and maybe Beth will disagree with me because of, of the choices you all made. And I, I understand what you did. It's a tooling problem. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if I just, I, you know, I'm worried that as we talk about scaling to thousands or tens of thousands of units, that, you know, it, the overhead, of, it's, not, it's not even the overhead of the CPU time that you spend running an OpenStack service. I think that that's a red herring. I think it's you know troubleshooting that or keeping up with code patches. Maybe there's a stability. You know, OpenStack is super stable, but everything you do at in, in that scale with that many of control planes, be, you know, every line of code exposes you to a risk that something's going to happen. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe there's a huge value. So in that let's that let's, let's maybe step back a little bit. Um, the the gentleman says he's able to run a full OpenStack uh, on a Raspberry Pi. So maybe we start from scratch. Do we even have a problem? If I can run OpenStack on a Raspberry Pi, what's the issue? So maybe kind of reset the conversation from No, no, no. I can run OpenStack on a Raspberry Pi. Don't think you can run that in production. Why not? So no, no, hang on. Hang on. So you, you, you figure out a way to run OpenStack as a whole mm -hmm. on a single Raspberry Pi. Now, Correct. granted, workloads and things like that are going to sacrifice. They're going to be sacrificed. But that in and of itself is just an indication say, hey, I can run an entire OpenStack implementation on maybe a quarter or a half of a CPU. Lots of people do that. I'm, I just, I just so haven't we have an issue? It. Lots let's of people back do up that and all. say, okay, do we have an issue? And if we have an issue, let's work from there. So the issue which you have 
with, so if you take a thing which is, okay, let's, let me rewind. Mine is a simple under my desk deployment. The problem you have is when you're talking about something at the edge where you've got thousands of locations where you want to run OpenStack. If all of these things are going to start yabbering to each other, life gets a whole lot harder than the stuff going on under my desk. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, so hold on a second. So there's two, two things. One is maybe they don't need to yabber each other. If it's hierarchical, you can just have, you know, Raspberry Pi at the edge does pretty much nothing except talk to the cloud. You know, that's, that's why I was talking about, like, what do you actually need out of Neutron? <laughs> to... Well, that's, a, that's an interesting point, Beth. Do we need those things communicating at all times? Do we need them yammering back and forth with each other? Right? So once the infrastructure is set up, so once you've gone and you spun up the VM, do I, do I need to monitor it? Do I need... Well, you, you need to monitor, no, but I mean, it's a monitor in terms of an OpenStack controller. No. You know, <laughs> continuously having a, a, a bus-based connection to that device. No, all you need is a, is a you know, every, every five, you know, five minute or one minute ping, say, hi, I'm alive. Are you I'm still alive. running? Yeah. yeah. So, so let's go back to the, the one place where you will get bitten if you go down this path. If you go down this path. If you want to have centralized Keystone, or you want to have a token from one OpenStack location respected at another OpenStack location, your life is going to get really sucky really fast. Sorry. We'll get the only way I can get around it is if I do a Federation of Keystone or I want to do Fernet. Those are my only two choices. Hang on. Both of us need to have microphones. I'll just come to you. Otherwise, nobody can hear what one of us is saying. And yours is smarter. <laughs> I'm not loud enough, so. I, I was just going to, I just wanted to clarify, you are talking about the jabbering back and forth you mean is like Nova checking that your token was legit from your up, upper level keystone. Correct. But Fernet does provide you a way around that. Right, but I mean, so if you want, you keep saying bus, so when you say bus, to me that means the message bus. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So if you have um, a whole bunch of um, things on the edge that are all regions in your one global keystone, you're using Fernet so they don't have to come back and verify your token every single time, you end up with no yammering between, between edge pieces. And you know, maybe you've got some thick edges that run the control plane and then like a thin edge over here that you just plug that compute node in over here to avoid him having to have his own control stack. Yeah. I mean, you should be able to scale quite a ways in regions like that because you end up with nothing shared between them except the fact that the top level thing is generating your tokens, right? Uh, one second. Uh, can we get him first and then we can go back? Yeah. I think we are going back to our previous. So this type of architecture, again, remote compute will come into the picture. Going back to Raspberry Pi, just for my feedback for that. So if we have a Raspberry Pi and it is running full open stack, and it is just controlling one Raspberry Pi, so what is the actual open stack was a full orchestration framework. The open stack is actually giving the full-fledged flexibility for scaling point of view. And as well as the tool which can manage them, workload, monitor them, and then you can take action. So again, in my personal opinion, having a one Raspberry Pi controlling one, two, three Raspberry Pi, instead of that, I will use all my Raspberry Pi, all my compute to use my workload, and I will put orchestration somewhere else. Because orchestration and, and monitoring, monitoring is also come into the picture. Wait. So we have to decide based on our use case, where we need a remote compute, where we need actually OpenStack component at that as well. So the, 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 the benefit of OpenStack is it provides you a lot of the aspects of you know, man, managing, maintaining, you know, instantiating a VNF. Maybe it's overkill, but it, it's still, I think we still benefit from those functions as a whole. How do we miniaturize it? Yep. What? 
right? So you need to uh, get glands so glands can only work with the local so cache. You need to get uh, distributed keystone working. Uh, you need to make sure that Nova and Neutron do not talk back. You need the local gateway services, which most SDNs don't support. So yes, you can currently twist OpenStack into a pretzel and get it to work as a remote compute, but uh, it doesn't want to support that use case. When I talk to the OpenStack cores, they're going to tell they're they're telling me I don't want a arm box under a pile of sweaters to be the use case that we support, and I cannot get them off that position. So if you can't convince OpenStack, Nova, and Neutron cores to accept this as a valid use case, why don't you just pick a different tool? Let's say Kubernetes, or let's say Docker and an orchestrator on top of it, uh, loosely coupled. OK, I have the token here. He's got the baseball bat. All right. Um, so, so clearly, there is a smallness of device at which point running OpenStack on it is ridiculous. OK, we all agree. There's some debate over exactly how small is too small. And I think that's a debate that's not going to get resolved today. However, let me put the thought, which is not a thought I've heard expressed, that there's enormous value to have the same kind of software at all scales from the viewpoint of training, education, familiarity, uh, even software development. Because Think of the enormous value that comes from having Linux running on supercomputers as well as Raspberry Pi and Android underneath, um, as well as so many other examples, right? I mean, uh, the. So my Wait. point is the value, people are missing the value of familiarity of the environment, the ability to transfer skills easily, and a whole host of other issues that come by having the same kind of machinery at multiple scales. Now, the implementation, which is the job of all these guys, everybody in this room, is to make the implementation work well, to do the subsetting cleverly, so that it's not unnecessarily heavy. But uh, I think I've not, heard it, I've not heard the point being expressed that there's huge value in, in this. In this. Uh, let me add to that. that. That is the reason that Verizon picked OpenStack for the virtual network services product. And Glenn, you were there when we did it. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar, <laughs> but you know, let's keep an open mind. And make sure that, you know, are we attacking this in the best way possible? Uh, you know, boil everything away and, and, you know, kind of attack it from that angle. That's what I'm looking at. And if we arrive back at, back at OpenStack, then we're, we're, we're headed in the right direction. I, I do feel that OpenStack has paved the way and kind of broken through a lot of these uh, barriers for us. I, I'm going to take a contrarian view. I don't agree with that in the least. I, I don't think that I, Linux is not Linux on different environments. It has different behaviors. We have multiple flavors of Linux that have different control sets. There's shared components of the code, but Linux is not Linux. And, and I think it's, it's not a good analogy at all. The reality is our, our pace of innovation says that we have different use cases emerging all the time, different tools do things better, and our industry has a tendency to choose the, the simplest, best tool to get their job done. Adding complexity into an operational environment is an anti-pattern. And so if we actually want this thing to scale, Beth, I respect what you did. I, I think you made good decisions for what you were doing to make it go. And, and where we were at, too, you know, and where the community was at. <laughs> right. But, but when I look at, you know, if, if you follow that argument, then back, you know, two years ago when OpenStack was trying to absorb containers and saying, we understand how to do this better than Kubernetes, it was just wrong. And we set ourselves back trying to tell the container people that we were right and they were wrong. And it wasn't true. And so I, I, I don't agree with this, and you now, know, see, I don't, I don't so let me, I let me respond. Let me respond to this point. It has been established by people like Jim Gray and others that the single biggest source of failures in operational environments is operator error. Yeah. Familiarity and things working the same way everywhere are a big way to reduce the chances of operator error. Um, the Nearly only thing looking the same or somewhat similar, et cetera, are guaranteed ways to have trouble. 
The only thing you're recycling is the API set. Uh, if I'm building an OpenStack cluster for 10,000 compute nodes, its internal architecture will be completely different and too far heavyweight to put in the Raspberry Pi. Uh, take a look at what River, Wind River had to do to put out commercial OpenStack that works on one or two nodes. It's not OpenStack anymore. It has the same set of APIs, but it is not OpenStack underneath. Your architecture knowledge of running 10,000 node compute cluster will not translate. So I'm plus one on this. Pick the, the simplest, possible, simplest possible edge implementation and go with it. And uh, if you want to hammer at OpenStack, then let's have the Nova and the Neutron cores in here uh, defending their statement that OpenStack shall never run on an ARM watch or it will never run on, a pile, on their pile of sweaters. So guys, let's, it sounds like we're defining a manifesto, right? We're defining this is what we would expect. Hey, so, moderator guy, I don't remember your name, sorry. I feel like, um, apparently your name's Glenn, so hi. Um, I feel like the specific things about NovaCore have been said twice now and I'd like the opportunity to respond to that, uh, which we didn't get last time if I could. Um, hi, I'm Michael. I'm a former Nova PTL and a former Nova Core. I got better. Um, <laughs> no. Remote compute is fine. We don't have a particular problem with it. What we've said is that we're not sure how well it would work. Come to us with real world data so we can help you. Part of the problem is that people think of OpenStack as this single coherent community. It is very not. All of the developers are funded by someone, and they're all funded to care about the thing that their funding source cares about. So it's super cool to come to OpenStack and say, you know, I want OpenStack to run on a thimble, but if there's no funding tied to that, it's not going to happen. So what we have always said is it's cool that you want that thing, but we are not funded to work on that. So you have to actually show up with resources. Um, those resources can come from your vendor. You can go to, I don't know, Red Hat or Mirantis or whoever, I don't really care, and give them money to buy a product, and then they fund devs. But, you know, if there's nobody in the room who is incented to care about that thing, then it doesn't happen. But, yeah, I've, I told someone during the break to run remote compute. Like, I just, I would like you to stop saying things that are not true, please. Yeah, shifting, shifting the gear, uh, I'm shifting the gear from mini Nova and mini Neutron kind, con kind of concepts, because anyway, they apply to VMs only. Uh, Kubernetes applies to whatever containers. I would rather go to a, a directory structure, which I think Verizon has implemented very well, the four or five level of uh, directories. I think that can actually become the registration at different levels, could be at SDN could be at the NFE, could be at the catalog for the images. So some kind of a directory structure which we use between the uh, edge cl clusters and the central cloud, that can be a key aspect, I believe, to not worry about a lot of things we talked about for miniaturization. And that can work for both, any form factor. It could be for a container, because it's just a name, naming issue. So I think, and that can be replicated. So there are many advantages of having a directory structure which spans between the clusters, whether it's a edge cluster, edge node, or a central cloud. That would be my take. OK. So one of the things I, you know, at least I want to get out of this, you know, working session, this is a working session, right? So, you know, can we come up with actionable items once we leave this thing to where, you know, we can ar actually start solving this problem? And, you know, I, I realize, you know, we all work from some, for somebody, we all have some, you know, vested interest. To his point, you know, the OpenStack environment is becoming a more taking than giving. So let's define what we need and then, you know, the next step from that would be what resources do we need to then make that def definition uh, uh, a reality? I, th I think in the first session, I th there was no clear definition of what do you mean by edge? Um, I think a lot of people Why here... Why is that? I mean, I, I don't understand. <laughs> we can all clearly define... Can we not clearly define the edge?
then you need a whole lot more hardware and a whole lot more well, okay. robustness there. That In the edge, what do you typically have at the edge? Uh, right now, I would say that that market is probably dominated by the telcos. Yeah, so but in, I've heard like eight scenario, examples here of... The well, so say, say we pick a company, they've got five or... Wait, please. Hang, hang on. Wait for the mic. Go ahead. Oh. All right. Well, I wanted to build on the last comment about there's no definition of edge that is out there at the moment. There's no agreed definition of edge. Okay, and if, if we try to move forward without one and without a specific use case, and telco applications are one use case, so they're, they're not the only use case, we're heading for failure. We're he heading for me meaningless discussions. So really, a, a, as an action, I would like to see out of this is uh, let's agree on some uh, set of use cases that we can work on and some perhaps standard configurations for of open stack you know maybe a small medium or large or you know i i don't know what it is but i mean it's not one so solution we're all technologists here we could can we not say that you know the edge is something that's not in say data center you know, where do we draw that boundary? Is it in the data center or is it outside the data center? It, it, it is. I mean, so you may not be able to quantify the edge in terms of number of compute or exactly. uh, number of cores, but you can always say the edge is going to be more resource constrained, constrained by an order of magnitude than the core, right? So here's a resource rich environment, here's a resource uh, poor environment. Uh, it's a deployment patterns or use cases, deployment patterns. I mean, so. It, is it a hub location or is it a spoke? I mean, there's, there's sure. ways that we can quantify this. And, and but I have a limited amount of resources. I want to make those available to my application with the minimum amount of overhead that I'm introducing into the mix. So do I deploy OpenStack differently in this scenario versus the core where I have unlimited resources and I want to show infinite capacity? Right? So it, it, does it boil down to a set of recipes and, and deployment patterns that are suitable for what I have in terms of hardware that I'm layering this on top of? Yeah. Open question. We talked about limited resources. And again, we limited physical resources, power resources, cooling resources, compute resources, human resources, operational resources. I mean, we have to define what limited resources mean, and when we're trying to we're trying to solve here, is we're assuming that edge nodes are going to be more numerous than our uh, regional or national nodes. So now we're talking about scale, so limited resources but scaled wide, and I think that's what we're talking about when we're talking about edge. But I think we need to I think we need to define it. I think we need to because we can't solve for. You know, we can't solve for, okay, we're going to put it on Raspberry Pis, but we need 100,000 of them. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So. I'm not really saying useful things anymore, but I was just going to say it also depends on what the use case is, right? Like, if you, if you want to have a single compute node at a cell tower run on solar power and generator all the time, but you only need to create an instance once every week or something, you probably want a Raspberry Pi as local control node that's you know very slow, but enough to provision the one compute node that you've got there, right? But if, you're, if your restriction is bandwidth over the WAN and you have all the power and cooling there that you need, you might put a whole control plane there and only talk to it over rest so that there's no chatter back and forth. It just depends on what you want. And we can come up with architectures that make sense, but. Well, I feel like, I feel like the, the conversation is kind of leaning towards we're outsiders trying to look inside something. But in reality, this is our space. We all should be able to poll ourselves and say, what are the use cases that are going to be the most common? You know, you can say, hey, you know, I need to run point of sale somewhere. Um, or somebody else says, hey, you know, I've, I've got a 500 coffee shops. I, they all boil down to maybe I need to spin up a routing VNF instance on a little four core box out there. And that's the only instance it's going to run for five years. So we should be able to, as, a, as, a, as an organization or as, as a community, be able to say, okay, uh, these are kind of the top 
three use cases that we see happening right now. Once we identify those top three use cases, then we can start evaluating as a community where we stand in that. Yes, but also maybe no. Like, that would be really useful. Oh, you, Debbie Downer, every time. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> you, you could also break it up by size. Do you want to reference architecture for a micro deployment? Um, smallest possible. Size of what? Yeah, Raspberry Pi or whatever, if we're okay. going to keep using that dumb example. Or, and, you know, something, a small deployment to you in, of traditional compute, the biggest compute boxes I can buy that fit in that space right now for you, whatever. We could, that's just a blog post, right? Someone yeah. could just sit down and write those, and maybe that would be helpful because it would make this conversation more concrete. But what is the difference between a 4-core, an 8-core, a 16-core, and a 32-core machine running at CPE at, at the customer? So, so the difference is the percentage of the resources that are taken by OpenStack. Exactly. The implementation itself should be a standard framework that we deploy in which we just customize to scale. But it totally depends to on scale. what you want to do with that. If you want to deploy a 16-core single instance on that 16-core box, then Nova has to check in for one instance. Yeah. Right, but if you want to put 40 instances on that, you know, 16 core box, then I think the reality of that is if we have edge to me is defined as, you know, maybe I'm biased because I came from the telco space, but edge to me is defined as some customer or some user sitting, you know, somewhere at the edge of the provider network or the provider cloud that is doing some very, you know, uh, basic network function at the edge. So in that case you know, they only need maybe one instance, and they're running multiple VNFs. They only need one tenant space for sure. Maybe we can give them multiple tenant spaces, but they all belong to that one customer, right? So the, the management of that tenant space remains very simple. So, so I, I, I just, I feel like it's, it's analysis paralysis at this point, so how do we get, get past that? So, so there are many, many aspects to that. And, and definition of a use case. So you, you mentioned tenants, you mentioned the size of the control node, but one aspect that I, I did not hear very much about is what kind of operations are we going to run on that control node? What is ops going to do? And that, that it's very different from some of the use cases that we've talked about here, like a, a telco use case where we deploy a, a firewall on a customer premise equipment uh, every month it, as one load on the control plane, but uh, if we have a, a, a customer trying to run a ping pong application on, a, on an edge node, then it might do that for five minutes, then you need to launch a new VM or a different VM every five minutes. That's a very different requirement on the control plane. So we, we got to talk about that too at some point. So I, I was just going to. Let me put a plug into the session that's following upstairs that I'm running design considerations. Hey, don't plug your session here. Uh, so I, I was about just, use cases. I was just going to say that, as Michael said, um, it makes sense to me in order to make progress on this, we probably need to somebody can volunteer, maybe Michael, to uh, you know try to throw up a straw man of like three use cases that vary by size and sort of the application demands. Maybe there's another variable. But like, when you try to define these things, you can always come up with an infinite number of combinations. But to get, make any progress, we need to pick about three that are distinctly different, and then actually apply, in my opinion, some of the theories about what solutions and stacks might work in different ways. And so I know a big part of what we left tomorrow a lot largely unplanned, because we figured there would be some you know, we would learn more today about what we want to talk about tomorrow. So yeah. maybe we can make more progress on this if a couple but of people volunteer to maybe, you know, t take a stab at, at what three distinct, uh, were you volunteering? Okay, and he, this gentleman back here volunteered as well. So I, the, the one thing I would add to that is solutions to existing market conditions, right? not solutions looking for problems. Like, you know, these really badass Kubernetes things and, you know, all of this other stuff. It's like, who do we have in the market right now that is utilizing OpenStack at the edge and what are the use cases that they're working on? And then sort of maybe, you know, quantify those and come up with solutions for the top three. Right? Okay. Ten minute time check. Okay. So do we, do we want to try to maybe? I, I do think we had an action, actually. I believe Michael and the gentleman in the back said that they'd be willing to 
Um, Michael, do you want to re-express what you, you were looking to do on, on that blog post? I'm just going to write up some straw man sample deployments, and then pe people can concretely tell me I'm wrong. Do, do we want to kind of outline that here, or is that something you want to do? Uh... I, w I was going to do it in an etherpad, so I'll just chuck a link to the etherpad at the bottom there if you want. Yeah, and that'd be great. Am I doing this for tomorrow? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to have whiteboards? There is a whiteboard up in, there will be a whiteboard up in session three, and so we can uh, do something ad hoc there. Do we want to finish up by, you know, polling folks in the audience who who've done these type of deployments and, and see, you know, I know best done the, the CPE. Is this, is that something that, you know, we can, we can talk about and then I yeah, don't know if there's IoT good people idea. in here or uh, edge analytics, autonomous devices? Uh, uh, so let me, let me maybe rephrase your question. Poll and figure out from, you know, this, this group, you know, what, what are their use cases for, for edge? And then that would help us then, you know, define, at least in this limited group, you know, what our top three use cases would be. Yeah? Yeah. That's what I'm Behind you. Can we also, can we also poll for, can we also poll for what uh, people's notion of size in terms of compute cores is? Of We're edge? all conscious about our size. Um, so we should also add on to that list number of activities per period of time, which is what Dan mentioned, how many VMs do you want to do in a week, in a year, or whatever? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, th those are good criteria, right? So how often are we, you know, um, building and tearing down a VNF? You know, what, is, what are the compute resources that are required? Am I gonna, am I gonna do a four core, or a 16 core, or a 32 core, um, you know, what, what are the resources that are confined into the, the sort of description of what edge really is? And I, I don't, me personally, I would say that I would not want to define edge by the number of cores that are out there. Nobody should say, look, edge is defined as anything that's underneath 64 cores or below. That to me doesn't make any sense, right? Because to me, an edge implementation could be, you know, we've got a big customer that, you know, has a data center presence and they want access into a provider network edge. And so we provide some stuff that they can do locally, which is very, you know, resource intensive. But by and large, everything they're going to be doing is going to be maybe in the cloud proper. Right. But so I wouldn't want to put, you know, a defining line on this is edge based on the, the resources they're going to consume. It would be something that's more akin to, you know, are you in the data center or are you sitting at the customer premise? That to me would be a very black and white definition. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if it's not in the center, is where is what I mean. Yes. But you can you can have customers with HA configurations and things like that. We have multiple racks, maybe you know host aggregations and things like that that are sitting at the same site, but... That's not edge to me. Well, well, if a customer's got, you know, one rack and that is their edge setup and, oh, what the hell, I need to make sure that, you know, Irma doesn't come in and wipe me out, maybe I set up, you know, maybe a geographic location where those two guys are... Yeah, that's not edge to me. That to me is edge. That's, that's edge in a sort of, you know, so redundant configuration. Make that the fat edge and we'll have... <laughs> yeah. 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 Right here, please. Yeah. I but I, I, I hate having to, you know, get kid-like, right? But we should start with if it's not in the cloud, if it's not at a data center, then it's edge. And then we further define. But I, I, I think, too, we, we touched on this about uh, location of, of where the equipment is and the size of the facility, power, cooling. The, these are all the things that are limited in a lot of telco edge locations. So... We're talking about small, large, medium. I think it has to be relative. Like yeah, relative. Said. That's a good point. So that edge is relative. But I, I would push back on using physical definitions at all. Well, I, no, I, hang on. I think, I think that what we're really, and what I think the topic is supposed, what I thought the topic was about, was about the management constraint. Right? When, when I think about edge, it doesn't matter if it's a thousand servers or one. 
Uh, it's about how you manage a, a lot of copies of a distributed infrastructure without having a distributed control plane, right? You have local control, you have limited access, you have you know, an infrastructure that's repeated a lot of times. Those are the things that, from a, a management operational perspective, are making edge distinct and hard. It doesn't matter how many servers you have. Those but aren't I, I, where I, the problems I, are to me. I do agree, but I also would agree that there's a, a relativity to it in that I go back to networking terms, right? What may be a NNI from a provider network standpoint or from a customer standpoint, the customer, say the customer is Starbucks. They've got a hub location that they've created an uplink to, say, AT&T or Verizon. Starbucks is going to call that an NNI. I've got a network to network interface. You look at AT&T or Verizon, Verizon to say, hey, that's just a uni to me. In the, in the same scenario, from a edge to you know, data center type of deployment, you're going to have maybe similar scenarios where the customer is going to consider that, hey, this is, this, is, this is it. This is the cloud. This is my data center. Right. But you're interfacing to the provider network. From the provider's perspective, you're just an edge. But the, the thing that made that Starbucks example an edge node in part is that there was no data center operational personnel that you're expecting to de be completely hands off, remote management, and that you have a lot of them that are all independent sites. Which is, those are non, I mean, the, the hyperscale cloud pattern is I have an incredibly homogeneous infrastructure with experts on hand in com incredibly controlled environments, which all those things are not edge. Edge is the other, other extreme of that definition. And I, I think it's. It, but I could have the same it, at an edge location. Sorry to interrupt. But I could have the same situation at an edge location where, a, you know, say from a Verizon perspective, you know, a rack full of four servers. It's not a it's not a very big implementation yep. to us. It's it's not, but you don't have a, if you don't have somebody who's running that as an operational construct and actually managing it as an active operational you infrastructure. Could. To me, that's the difference between edge or not. If it, if it's it it to me the, the the useful definition here, which is what we're trying to get to, is about the management of the control plane and the replication of it. So let's start at the. 60,000 foot level and define edge there. I think that at that altitude, it's either in the cloud or in a data center or not. Would you agree there? Okay, so we've got agreement at the 50,000 foot layer, right? That no. edge is defined as something that's not in the data center. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi. So remember what the name of this, this uh, thing Three is? Three minutes. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's, um, it's massively distributed. So what I think we are saying is there's actually two use cases here. There's the massively distributed where it's a very tiny little thing down, out at the edge, uh, maybe one box, um, which is the Verizon use case. Or there's a set of uh, cloud, you know, more traditional clouds that are distributed. Um, they're both valid use cases. We are doing both of them. We need to solve them in different ways. I don't think you can use the same tools. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Th there are, <clears throat> the simple definition of Azure, as per my understanding, that tied to mostly the use cases, the application, because the Azure def the definition will be different based on your services, what you are providing. For example, for telco cloud, the edge is the tower where the actually services further distribute to the subscriber. For wireline, that is the aggregator hub where the fiber terminate, then it goes there. But now if we look into the Skype and the internet services, their edge definition is different because they are targeting each and every subscriber. So they are actually targeting the person inside the house who is using their services. For them, they, they are actually targeting that. And in IoT use case, the edge is where the sensor. So based on each and every use case and application and services, the edge definition is tied to the subscriber, the services, where the services terminate, and then they hand over to the subscriber going forward. Yes. Yeah, my, my comment was going very much in the same direction. So if we want the definition of edge, it's not just data center versus outside the data center. You've got to take location into account. Where are you located? If it's a wireline case, you may want to take into account which wires terminate on this edge node. What is the latency to the actual device you want to serve from the edge node? That that. The fact that you've got to take those notions into account of what the latency is, 
that is very new. It, it, is, it, it is not vanilla OpenStack and it needs to be built in sometimes. So it's not just a question of size, it's not just a question I, of agreed. data centers. There's Performance, many right? more. There's yeah. many more aspects that are new that we got to take into account for the edge. Very good point. Okay, so we've had a, you know sort of some lively conversation. I think possibly most people in the room got a chance to speak. Um, I think you know we've outlined a lot of things here that um, you know we've got concerns about. You know, typical edge deployment deployments. We, I think we accomplished at least some level of definition in terms of what cloud is, right? Nobody's disputing the fact that, you know, edge is something we'll loosely define as something that exists outside the data center. Yeah? So the takeaways, or I'm sorry, the, the action items that we have leaving this is Michael's has been volunteered <laughs> to, voluntold. This to, uh, as well is also volunteered. Well, I'm sorry? I also volunteered. He also volunteered to work with Michael. What was your name? Paul Andre. Paul, okay. So Paul and Michael. So one of the things that we would expect to happen from you guys is you're going to kind of use your crystal ball and understand what are the typical use cases, come up with the top three, and define from your perspective or your opinions, you know, what, what those use cases are. And then, you know, at some point we need to meet and discuss those use cases. and. Uh, you know, go and, from there. So I don't know what time tomorrow. Of there's a whole unconference um, time set aside. So to me, this would be a great topic to follow up on, um, and, and block some time off at the unconference tomorrow. David, yeah. you might be able to tell them how that works. Yeah. So we will, um, Michael. You'll have an outline by then, so people can come and have a, a talk. Uh, I'm volunteering. You're finished. Done. Excellent. Um, also, just quickly before we break up, if everyone could please thank Glenn and yourselves for an excellent session. That was really valuable. We're going to take a 15 minute break and then we're coming back to, it'll be more control plane in this room, so please come back and hopefully we'll dig down a little bit more into the control plane. 15 minute break, please be back then. Anything else? We're good. Thank you. <laughs>